Welcome back to the Tale of Edgar Trunk, the official podcast. This is episode four. Cuatro. Cuatro. We are rereading the entire series, one book at a time. We have started with the first chapters, and we are now chapters seven and eight out of 12. I can't believe it. We're past the halfway mark at this point. Oh, we get like way past the halfway point during these two chapters. Yes, we do. And some... Is about to go down. Ooh. This is like things that go bump in the night. The creatures, they all come out. I'm excited. Let's meet them. They are not always as advertised. Yes. I feel like for both of these chapters, the theme is, and maybe you could title the episode, Don't Judge a Creature by Its Cover. (laughs) Well... You must be excited because I know two of your all-time favorite characters for the entire series, and I got to say, some of mine, are have made their appearance. I'm so excited. Let's meet them. (laughs) Let's meet them. All right. So uh, just a quick summary of chapter seven. It's called Storage Closet B. Uh, If you'll remember, at the end of the last chapter, Edgar has passed out from exhaustion, and so we pick up here. He has fallen asleep from his exhaustion, and he has uh, dreams of a machine, the machine that we've talked about, only in his dreams, it's all shiny and new, it hums, it's like clean energy, and he just has this connection with it for some reason, but uh, the dream passes, and he awakens and finds himself in a dusty storage closet with oxygen masks and some oxygen tanks, so uh, not too exciting. And uh, certainly, though, a place he's never been. So he examines the room, and just seeing how dusty it is, he takes a finger and kind of, like, draws, like, a finger line in the dust on one of the uh, the oxygen tanks. And uh, all the dust that's gathered on his finger, he blows it off. Just, you know, get the dust off his hands. Well, when he does, he hears this little tiny shouting. It's like an old man, tiny shouting at him. He doesn't know what this is about or where it's coming from. And uh, finally, he puts it together that he has blown two little creatures sky high into the air. And uh, he finally catches one of them. And uh, he's this old man, uh, old man character, uh, whose old lady wife has ended up in Edgar's hair. And so they work together and Edgar's able to get them down into his hand. And he has this conversation with these two creatures, very tiny, that he's meeting for the first time, who are literal dust bunnies. And they're just this old couple named Harold and Margaret, and they're adorable. Harold's all crotchety and grumpy, and Margaret has to put him in his place constantly, and uh, he probably secretly fears Margaret, but he's all tough on the exterior anyway to everyone else. Uh, They're delightful. Uh, Once you get past the, like, Harold gruffness, it's just sort of part of his charm. So they proceed to have this great conversation. Um, these dust monies, they mentioned that until yesterday, they hadn't had a visitor in over 20 years. Edgar puts it together that the visitor uh, was none other than uncle, his uncle Warnock. <laughs> Apparently, Warnock had been in a frenzy. He was worried. He was searching for something. And he kept muttering, of course, to himself, uh, largely about the cloak, in quotation marks, coming for him. Uh, Of course, he also uh, made some further condemnations about Edgar being unfit. He just can't help himself. And uh, none of this is really too surprising for Edgar. And he goes on to share that he was nearly eaten by a large, scary wolf. Uh, The dust bunnies kind of shaking their heads. They tell Edgar that things weren't always like this. There was a time before things were very different. And uh, here they tell him uh, a story about a clean factory back in the day, cheerful workers, Uh, And then how it was all ruined when a mysterious darkness moved in. They claim that the factory has been in disrepair for over a century. Uh, But uh, I have to cheat a little and warn the listener that dust bunny years may differ from human years in terms of length. Uh, But the point is, it's been a minute. Harold and Margaret, uh, they, they go on to speak of change that's been happening, sort of ongoing, 
since the darkness kind of took over the factory, but that there seems to have been an escalation of change as of late, like in, in the last several days, maybe weeks. Uh, this idea that like an impending doom has finally arrived or it will soon. They speak of him, who we've heard a little bit about, that uh, they speak of him being frightening and also say he's responsible for the darkness and the current condition of the factory and the world. They warn Edgar, steer clear of anything to do with him, if he can help it. Uh, they, they further go on to talk about how evil him is and etc. Edgar acknowledges that, uh, yeah, he probably can't steer clear. But this whole topic of Edgar's name then comes up. Seems they've, uh, the Dust Bunnies, heard rumors of a boy named Edgar who they say was descended from a long line of inventors. And uh, even uh, among those inventors along this long line, the parents of this Edgar were some of the inventors who created this factory and created this thing called the World Machine. And Edgar sort of excitedly is wondering, is he that Edgar? And they kind of put it together. The Dust Bunnies recall that the, the kid's name was Edgar Noon, or Edgar No One, depending on how you read it. <laughs> and, uh, well, this Edgar, his last name's Trunk, so it just can't be him, even though the details seem awfully suspiciously similar to Edgar's story. And so Edgar's a little bit disheartened, but not really. I mean, he didn't really expect that there was anything special about him, but the idea was nice for a moment. So as we round out the end of the chapter, um, his meeting with these curious dust bunnies is coming to an end, and he realizes as he tries to exit that the door he entered to get in there only opens from one side. So he's stuck in this room with them. Uh, the dust bunnies reveal that there actually is another way out, or a way out, and that there is a second door hidden behind a bookcase or a shelf that uh, the only problem is it leads to the outside. Well, it just so happens Edgar has no choice and that he's in a room that has an oxygen mask and oxygen tanks. So he kind of realizes this is what I got to do. He considers the situation and uh, he just embraces it. He must steal himself and be prepared to go outside the factory. It's almost like an astronaut. You got to suit up before you go out to the great unknown. Oh, yeah. There's like this total like Armageddon movie montage getting ready. Yeah, it'd be fun. While Harold and Margaret are cheering him on from from the shelves. They're like using their full body weight to like close one of the clasps. <laughs> <laughs> Do one button. Yeah. Well, I think one of the coolest things that comes out of this um, out of this chapter is that Harold and Margaret are telling Edgar, you, this boy, Edgar, he's rumored to come from a long line of inventors. Like, what is that about? Yeah, I feel like when we look at a lot of series that are out, and a lot of like movies and TV shows as well, that are for a younger audience that are fantasy adventure, you don't really come across a lot of inventors where inventors are sort of like the the primary trade that's really valued. You know, you have magicians, you have other things, but like in this story, the inventors, they're like this fabled, we learn more as we go, but they're this fabled character. And, you know, when you really think about it, for me, this was really something I was drawn to, this idea of inventors, because when you look at, like, all the species in existence, what is that thing that separates humans from every other species on the planet? And we're inventors. You know, we are not stronger than most of the animal kingdom. Like, in a one-on-one battle without inventions, we're totally prey. We're done for. Oh, I mean, a uh, spider could kill us. And spi- it's <laughs> oh, our tiny. fits could kill us if he's going crazy. Our cat. Yes, he, uh, I think he's tried. And just how we survive, our survivability, our adaptability, it largely comes from our ability to invent. Now, yeah. there are like, there's this insects and there's like, there are species that do invent. It's really fascinating. But our ability to invent on the level that we invent as a, as a human race, it just, it, 
that is, we are the next in the food chain regarding just where we stand. No, nothing can compare or compete. Yep. That's our superpower. And so I just, yeah, I love that you said that that's our superpower. I mean, that is something that's just really fascinating. And so it's something that is explored. And so when Edgar learns that he might be descended from a line of inventors, it's almost like, for a moment, he thinks, am I royalty? Right. Is my great-great-great-grandfather Steve Jobs? <laughs> yeah. Is my name Edgar Jobs? <laughs> <laughs> no, your name's Edgar No One. Yeah, Edgar No One, which is such a cool name. It is. I think they, yeah, I, I've gone back and forth, and I don't know if it was like a subconscious thing, if it was a slip or whatever, but yeah, like, I always read it as noon. But no one is so much cooler and like, was my subconscious making this creative choice? Well, yeah. I mean, I thought you wrote that intentionally, like down the line, people would talk about this Edgar no one because he was a no one. I, he didn't have any special powers or any like he got abandoned at the factory. Like he didn't even have a name and not a last name. He was just Edgar in a trunk. So that's how he got his name, Edgar Trunk. So who is this kid? Oh, he's no one. Edgar, no one. Edgar, no one. Uh, there, this is an ongoing theme that we've discussed a little, but I think it was the last episode we were talking about Edgar's connection to like machinery, like, yeah, descended from inventors, possibly, probably, but inventors invent things, inventions. This machine that we've heard so much about clearly had to be invented. Edgar has this sort of connection with it. And the opening paragraph of the first chapter uh, leans into that. So I just wanted to share that. Um, this is the chapter. This is uh, the dream that I mentioned. Edgar dreamt of the machine shiny and new. Bright light gleamed off its copper plates. The mammoth spheres hummed with energy, clean vibrations emanating from its surface. A force lured him closer, the soft drone an irresistible lullaby. He gazed upon it, wanting more, but the dream was soon over. And then uh, this, the chapter goes on to say, the glorious vision left emptiness in its wake. Thoughts of creatures, dark and vast, villains and evil foes, passageways and chambers, strangers bearing warnings, thoughts of freedom. Edgar sat up and opened his eyes. He'd ended up in a cramped room filled with oxygen masks and oxygen tanks. So definitely feeling elated, feeling maybe a little empty after this dream. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's such a like ethereal dream that he's having that he's not quite sure what it means, but it leaves him wanting more. What does it mean? Yeah, I mean, what do you think? I think Edgar has a sort of connection to this machine. We've talked about a world machine in previous episodes. So it starts, I start to wonder if he has some sort of connection to the world machine in some way, and it's showing to him through his dreams right now. Yeah, like, is there this link where it's talking to him in, in a way? There's this constant before and after with this machine, with this factory. There's like this, whether it's in what he drew, when he did his mural with the creation stones. It's the factory with the sunset. You know, it's before the current condition of the factory. It's, you know, he hears from the dust bunnies about how things were before, that the factory was not always evil, not always bad. These machine, this machine parts or this world machine with this vision of a machine it's like he sees the beautiful, clean, gleaming, humming version. And he also sees the forgotten, you know, powered down, abandoned version. And so clearly this is important imagery for sure in the book, maybe in the series. And we should pay attention to it. 
but it's a mystery at this point. Yeah. I love the visuals though. Uh, it lends itself to a little bit of like a steampunk vibe, which is totally, fun. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has that, which is cool. Little Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> little Mad Max. <laughs> little Mad Max. <laughs> So uh, there was something else in this chapter. These characters are just, Harold and Margaret, they, they're dynamic with each other. is so fun. But uh, this little passage kind of summed up their relationship with more of a specific. Um, Harold's always complaining. And so Margaret shuts him up in, in this scene. It's this one little passage on page 99. She says, Harold, please put a lid on it. That's the problem with this. That's the problem with that. You're an expert on the problems of the world. Facing Edgar, she says, he is too. He just doesn't do anything about solving them. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I know. There's a, I, I had underlined a line from Harold where he's like, uh, didn't your mother ever teach you not to stare? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Margaret says, do pardon Harold's social skills. He doesn't have any, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Yeah, they're so lovable somehow. And uh, with the first passage, I really like that. The, again, it's this idea of you just because you're a good person with good intentions doesn't make you a hero. And so how do we, just this differentiation, there clearly is a, it's like, a good side and an evil side. And so when we meet characters, we, we get pretty much so far anyway, we get right away. Are they on the good side? Or are they on the bad side? And yeah, on like the side they're on, especially on the bad side, there's levels. There's like tiers of who's really in charge or fearful or threatening. And uh, do they fear who fears who on the, on the side of the, the villains. But there is, again, it's just this idea that, you know, Harold, he is uh, an expert on all the problems of the world. Clearly, as I think and a lot of us are this way, we can identify the problems in our world, but how many of us actually take action to solve them? And that's such a line of differentiation between Edgar and these characters that he's meeting, good and bad. Well, what I love about these characters is that they are so light-toned in comparison to the other characters that we've met who have some sort of gravity to them in the situation. It's like the factory affects them more, whereas Harold and Margaret, they're going to last whether it's a dark world or a light world. They're still there, and they're still the same people that they were 100 dust bunny years ago. So I love that, I love that they're just kind of a, you know a breath of fresh air even though Harold is the most crotchety old man ever, they're still, they represent like the normal people in the world that used to be and that still can be. They're representing the majority. And I think a lot of times in stories, it's easy to focus in on the minority. Like who's the bad, who's the villain? Who's the hero? Who are like the support characters to help the hero along? And maybe who are the support characters to help the villains along. But there's all these other people. I mean, if you build a world, a world is populated by people. And even though we don't, we, we definitely feel that the world of the factory that Edgar finds himself in in book one is kind of desolate. There aren't, it's not really populated. But there's still a sense of there is a world, at least there was, and that there were people in it. And then we have these characters like Harold and Margaret who sort of represent the everyday people. Yep. I mean, Stupot has a, a level of that too, where it's like he has a job, he has a place, and he's not really ever going to venture beyond those boundaries. Yeah, but Stupot operates out of fear, whereas Harold and Margaret are like, they don't really play by the rules because it doesn't affect them. They're there regardless. So they're more outspoken. They're very open and willing to share history. And I, that's there's because of that, they're so different than every other character in this book. 
they're a little bit untouchable. You know, they feel immortal in a sense. They feel exactly like you said, they're going to survive the apocalypse. Okay. Not everyone listening will get this reference, but they kind of remind me of Uncle Randy and Aunt Sarah. Oh my gosh, how? Well, we had brunch with them in the last year and just the way they kind of snip at each other like old couples do. I was like, oh my God, they're the same. Oh, I don't think they, they did though as much as Harold and Margaret do. No, definitely not. And Uncle Randy is not an old crotchety man. No, they're, but they're sweet and mild-mannered and do bicker. Yes, as, as old couples do. Hey, young couples do. Guilty. <laughs> so uh, do you want to move on to Chapter 8, A Pathless Wood? Let's do it. While you look that up, <laughs> I have to single this out because I have, have had so much fun just looking back on like the books within the book. Oh, yes. So we... we we had the little passage about Marge McGinty. Loved it. Couldn't get to heaven she, because of her mass. Um, this chapter has one that's pretty pretty written out. And uh, it comes from a moment of how Edgar's feeling, and it makes him think about this book that he read. And the book that he read was about a Captain Dan Tambers, who I guess it's like a memoir. He's writing about... This is Dan Tam- Captain Dan Tambers. He's writing about how he felt his first time at sea, isolated, alone on a small boat, surrounded by ocean on all sides, nothing in the distance but more distance. And Edgar recalls this verse uh, from Captain Dan <laughs> Captain Tambers' book, which is called Hope Floats, But a Mighty Heart Sinks. And this is the passage. And it, it is sort of written in a dialect, so I'll... I'll I'll do, uh, hopefully I do it justice. A thingum, much lichen a whale, passed neath us. It had teeth on its head, which went round its powerful some maw. The first mate pitched bread into the waters, along with all our meats and poultry stores. A hen, <laughs> a hen was named Vespers, gallant farmy rogue that had lived with us for months at sea and had made the waters his own like a wolf that takes a lichen to a kitten and raises it on her milk. He went in, too. <laughs> we was paying terrible homage, homage to his beastly wail for him to leave us be, but was the skipper who pointed out that what he was concerned, that what we was concerned as the sea's most terrifying minion was just a shadow caused by a cloud floating past the moon. So there was no will. And he was right. And all the rest of four days, we were downright sad for Vespers. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Vespers. Poor Vespers. Aww. He sacrificed himself into the waters. Why did they throw everything out? I think they were like trying to make an offering to the whale, like, eat this, don't want to eat us. Oh my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. And there was nothing there. I mean, it was the Moby Dick, the Moby No Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Moby No Show. The Noby. Okay, chapter eight is called A Pathless Wood. So, closer. Chapter eight is called A Pathless Wood. So, where we start this episode is Edgar finally is getting outside the factory. Harold and Margaret told him, move this shelf out of the way and beyond it you'll find an exit door. And just like an astronaut, he'll suit up with his oxygen tank and mask and go through a door into a chamber and out the factory he goes. When he's out there, he realizes, oh, crap. There's Krillos out here and they have the wail of a wraith. Wraith? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. (laughs) That could kill you. And... I'm going where no boy had ever gone before. So this is a huge moment for Edgar. And when he gets out there, we see pale branchless trees, thick layers of smog, and a ceiling of black. I mean, essentially, we're now seeing what is the cover of book one. You can see it just on the cover page. Everything that's described in chapter eight 
describes the outside world of the factory. So it's cool to see that come to light. And the one thing that Edgar is scared of is the Krillos. But he knows he needs to explore, so he, he remembers learning of a river. So he starts to look for the river. And he knows he can make his way back to the factory when he runs out of oxygen because his feet are making footprints. But he realizes all of his footprints are disappearing. And not only that, his oxygen is depleting fast. Oh, boy. So he's got to figure out, do I keep going? Do I turn back? All of a sudden, a Krillo appears through a wisp of fog. And Edgar is freaking out. He's seeing a Krillo for the first time. What does he do? Well, guess what? Another one appears. Another one, another one, another one. There's five Krillos in the distance. So he starts to back away into the woods, never taking his eye off of them because he's freaking out. Well... He stumbles into someone hiding behind a tree. And this person knows Edgar and actually knows about his dreams of the banyan tree, which is really suspicious. This stranger tells Edgar that the trees outside are actually people, but they're bad people. And when you touch them, they sort of crumble or deteriorate, deteriorate. Deteriorate. <laughs> <laughs> Deteriorate. So uh, Edgar learns that this stranger with the beak is a Krillo. And he's not actually as scary as Edgar imagined. And his name is Sebastian. And before they know it, a big, thick wave of fog is coming in. And Sebastian is like, We've got to run. We've got to get away. Follow me. And Edgar's like, why would I follow you? I don't even know who you are. But you did help me in the factory before. And the fog starts to make all these angry, loud machine noises. And he's like, you've angered the fog. We've got to go. Jump into this hole. And Edgar's like, where does that even lead to? And he's like, take off your oxygen mask. You're not going to fit in here in the hole. So Edgar takes a leap of faith, quite literally, takes off his mask and jumps into the hole after Sebastian to escape this incoming wave of fog. And that leads us to the end of chapter eight. So uh, some good action then. Oh my gosh, a lot of action. And we finally get to meet this mysterious beaked stranger. Well, we learn about the Krillos on page one. They are described as crow-like, but much larger. And two other distinct characteristics, they don't have talons. They have feet like an old person. Nothing's wrong with that, but on a bird, it's quite strange. And the toenails are like barely hanging on. So they've got these big, big old human feet. And the other thing is that they have this crazy penetrating scream that can kill you. (laughs) So we know also that Warnock is terrified of Krillos and that Stupot, the mere halfway pretending to be a Krillo walking down the hallway, sent Warnock into a tizzy. And uh, we also know that Edgar had some help when he was in that chamber and the mechanical praying mantises were after him and uh, this stranger, he caught a glimpse of a beak. That's it. And uh, the, that creature gave him this little velvet pouch of the creation stones. And now he's getting help from this stranger again, only now he sees and proves that Sebastian, his name we learn, uh, that Sebastian is a Krillo. So not only that, he's seeing like all these Krillos. Outside, but they don't appear to be moving. Yeah, strange. And Sebastian says that they're not quite dead. So what are the, we got like zombie Krillos here? What, well, what's happening to them? Right. What's this like weird cloud machine or machine hidden in a cloud? It's like this like fog that's depositing them 
like they're flamingo statues or something. They're not moving. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, and we binged this like five years ago. I'd never seen this. So I guess it was just two interesting ideas that set, were had separately across industries. But uh, Lost, when they're on the island in the first season, and it's like that loud clanging, it's like that machine. Yeah. It's like a fog machine, basically. Yeah, yeah, Well, not yeah. a fog machine, but like a machine made of fog. Right. Yep. And it's making all these loud noises. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it comes back, and I think we do see it eventually. But yeah, it's like this, this weird, it's fog, which in itself, like you could run your hand through it. Like it's substance, but not really. Right. And it's just hard to imagine like a machine of that quality of texture or substantiveness, substance, substance. Don't ask me. <laughs> but again, just one of the, the numerous mysteries of this factory and this island, which there's something going on. It's like there was a, the line, I, I underlined it. The place was just as much of a labyrinth on the outside. This place is, a, it's like they are mice in a maze and there's no way out even when you're out you're not out because he would leave away from the factory and then like see the factory again his footsteps would disappear you know he's on an island and yet he can't get to the edge of it sort of nightmarish and so there's some magical thing happening whether it's an illusion whether it's real Hopefully we'll figure it out, but very creepy. And and yeah, you when you were telling us that the trees that have this like slick black core and that like this pale trunk, if you touch it, it kind of sloughs off to reveal the core. And then Sebastian tells us, tells Edgar that they're people. Like those are people. That reminds me of like the little uh, seaweed characters in The Little Mermaid. <laughs> I don't remember them. Ursula, t every oh, yeah, person yeah, yeah, who yeah, goes yeah, yeah. under her charm, she turns them into these like little. It was like an eel, right? Squiggling seaweed. No, they're like in the ground, like squirming around. They're her prisoners. Ugh. She turns. King Triton into one for a second before he comes back. But that like turning people into a plant or a, a, like an inanimate object, but right. it is an inanimate object. It's alive. It's like so creepy. Very creepy. And you have to wonder who were these people? Why are they like this? Can it happen again? Can it be undone? We don't really know. But one thing is certain. This is a dreadful, creepy, frightening place. And even though there's action, this place feels like there are long gaps of silence. It's not like you're on the run all the time, creatures everywhere, evil everywhere. It's more of like a dreadful, creeping, sort of a menacing uh, vibe, it feels like. So Sebastian says... Just trust me. If you had known these people before, you would not feel sorry for them. They're bad people. They put the big fella to shame. Edgar, the big fella? Do you mean Uncle Warnock? Ah, him. Terrible sort. What does he mean by that? Put him to shame. What are these, like, workers that... Yeah, I think uh, he's saying, like, these workers were, were even worse than Warnock is. In terms of, like, they're bad people. They're not just like they they slipped up and they, they did one bad thing that one time. This is like, these are bad people. They're truly evil. Yeah, these are like, you know, I, they should be in prison or, you know. Well, they are in a some sort of prison, the yeah. tree prison. Right, so the joke was on them, I guess. And who turned them into trees? I mean, I assume it was him. Yeah. Man. If I got turned into a tree, I just hope that you would be the tree next to me. Oh my gosh, me too. Our roots could intertwine. <laughs> oh, babe. The whole root hands. It's so romantic. <laughs> we could slough each other's barks off. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Ew. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I like that we get outside the factory. Oh, me too. I'm so glad it finally worked. Edgar was able to get out. And I'm so glad we get to meet this mysterious beaked stranger who is Sebastian. And he's a nice Krillo. Don't judge a creature by its cover. Yeah, and I I think it's the next chapter, but we will get more of a more context on the Krillos. We've heard about we've heard a lot about them and they, their mentions are pretty regular throughout. And now that we've met one officially, uh we we do get their stories. So it'll be fun to talk about that. We're we start to get I think with these chapters we're starting to get a little more of the actual lore of this world. You know, the Dust Bunnies, we learned about them. We kind of get a sense of their kind of outside time in a way. They are a little bit untouchable, and they've seen a lot, and they're going to continue to see a lot, but they're probably not going to have any impact, direct impact on events. I um, also want to point out that on the back of the book is a silhouette of a Krillo. So you get a sense of what they look like. But I am curious, maybe you wrote this in the book, how tall are they? I'm trying to remember if it's actually written. I imagined them like three feet tall. Okay, so he's like eye level with Edgar. Well, no, because Edgar's 10, so Edgar's probably like four and a half feet tall. I'm 4'11", and I'm 34 years old. Yeah, but... (laughs) And yours is <laughs> almost your height at age 10. That sounds about accurate. Yeah, I would say 10-year-olds are pretty yeah, I mean, close our, to my size. Our son's not even three, and he's three feet tall, and we're not tall. So this it's is not true. like he's got he, – and he's short for his age. Okay, so he's looking down at this Krillo. Yeah, yeah. I imagine the Krillo is six feet tall. Dang. I know, well, because they're so scary, or they're supposed they to be him. scary. He could just ride him to safety. He wouldn't need to <laughs> chase behind him. Well, that's the beauty of imagination, isn't it? It's true. I know. In your mind, he's like the griffin in Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. He's huge. Wow. Hey, who, who knows? With size 13 feet. I've never met one, so I couldn't swear to the exact height. You've never met one. You only created one. Right. <laughs> I created them to be about Sage's height. That's kind of cute. Oh, my God. What if Sage was a Krillo for Halloween? <laughs> That'd be amazing. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait for the first person to be a, an Edgar Trunk character for Halloween. I don't know who it's going to be. I doubt it's happened yet. Challenge accepted. <laughs> oh, wow. These, uh, these chapters were interesting. We definitely expanded the the world of where Edgar has been and now we've jumped in this hole and now there's Sebastian and it feels like we're going to get a little bit more help from Sebastian than we've gotten from anyone else so far. And yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. We have, I mean, I'm going to look now. Four, right? Four more chapters left. Four more chapters. And let's see, the book is only, 207 pages. We're already on 140 something. We're already on 143. So we have like 60 pages left. That's it. I only got like 60 pages left. The next chapter is called Fall from Grace. And I can't wait to hear what that's all about. Oh, well, that's... Yeah, that's the Krillo one. More Krillo? More Krillo lore. Love it. We are definitely going to be racing toward the end at a fever pitch. Uh, Our next episode, let's see, there's four. Yeah, we got two episodes left. So we will be racing toward the climax. Everything's been a slow and steady build. It's going to turn the corner real soon. Next episode. Thanks for sticking around and reading the book, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, uh, write a review, only if it's positive, (laughs) (laughs) and give us some five stars. Thanks, guys.